What? Hi! Mother's hysterical, Daddy's collapsed, and Kenny's disappeared with my wardrobe. I hope you're satisfied with your day's work. I thought it was a very nice ceremony. A little hokey. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 51 and we're back to Cole's selection. What did you choose today? I chose Little Murders from 1971, directed by Alan Arkin and written by Jules Pfeiffer based on his initially unsuccessful play and starring Elliot Gould, Marsha Rod, Vincent Gardenia, Elizabeth Wilson, John Corks, John Randolph, Doris Roberts, Lou Jacoby, Donald Sutherland, and Arkin himself as a frazzled police lieutenant. It's about a young woman who saves a man from being beaten, makes him her boyfriend, and takes him home to meet the family, all while dealing with obscene phone callers, garbage strikes, brownouts, and neighborhood snipers in a New York City that is reaching terrifying dystopian levels of dysfunction. I did want to issue a bit of a spoiler warning this time. We don't usually do that, especially with films like this that are almost 50 years old, but I think so few people have seen this that I don't want to ruin any surprises for them, so go watch if you haven't, and then come back for the discussion. And I feel like it's a real shame that it hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves because it is such a singular experience. I don't know anything else like it, do you? I don't, and this falls into the category of a film I wish I had seen much earlier. What kept you from seeing it before? We're obviously both huge Elliot Gould fans, so I thought maybe you had run across it because of that. I had simply never heard of it. Hmm. It had never come across my radar, sadly. It took you to bring it to me. (laughs) Funny you should mention it, because I almost didn't. At least for the show. Only once I chose it for the show did I realize how personal this film is for me. It's a thing that I very much want to keep for myself. Not to myself in that sort of cinephile snob way, but for me in the sense that it nourishes me in a very specific way. And I feel a little bit selfish about it. I've never shown it to anyone before, especially in the same way that I will often share things with people in an effort to evangelize about movies that I really love, like this show. There's a whole lot of me in it. I think you saw this, clearly. And it's ironic, maybe a little bit, perhaps, because it's one of those things, I think, that if I did show it to people, if I could show it to people, they would really understand me a little bit better. If I had a list of films that added up to who I am, if you could put five movies together, like Voltron, to make a huge fighting machine, this would be the head of the robot. I think it's especially ironic because you identify most with the character of Patsy's mother, Mrs. (laughs) Newquist. Only because we're both hilarious. So we have our opening scene, and it is daybreak in Patsy's apartment. You've got the open window, the clock radio going off, the sound from the street below. And immediately it seems to betray its stage roots to me. These all feel like theatrical conventions rather than cinematic conventions to me, and that does not go away throughout the film. Did you think so? Did it feel that way to you right away? I did think immediately that it had once been a stage play, and they clearly have opened it up a lot more, but you can feel, especially in the big family scene later on that we'll get to, those roots. So as Patsy rouses from her slumber, she deals with, in quick succession, Obscene phone callers, obsessed former lovers, filthy water. And you get the impression that all of these things are just part of her day, just part of her routine. She doesn't think twice about them, but it's really an exaggerated existence. The satire on some of this stuff is turned up to 11, clearly. It's sharp and incisive, but I feel like there's a little bit of Jules Pfeiffer the cartoonist and caricaturist coming through rather than Jules Pfeiffer the dramatist. In those situations? 
Later, she very specifically refers to these occurrences in her life when she is talking to Alfred, whom we will meet very soon, about the litany of obstacles and indignities that she faces on a daily basis in which she maintains her eternal optimism. So maybe it's not so much of an exaggeration as I think. Maybe it's not a caricature, but rather a character. Do you have a list of similar hurdles that you have to negotiate to maintain your happiness and focus and productivity throughout your day? Well, you might also be able to answer this a little bit as well, but it makes me think of something that Roger Ebert had said, and I'll try to come back to a couple of his points throughout this. And one was that with the satire, it hits people in different ways. You respond to the thing that hits you where you live, I guess. And this doesn't, this part doesn't for me. There are a couple of moments later on that really speak to me, but I guess I don't wake up feeling like the world is out to screw me. I probably have at different points and I can also probably devolve into that sort of negative thinking. But when I think logically, no, my life is pretty easy. The morning commute would be the most difficult or stressful thing or managing the dog. Okay, now that I'm saying these things, maybe the world <laughs> does wake up to screw me. Well, so much of her stuff seems to be contingent upon being a woman in New York City in the late 60s, early 70s. So that might be some of why you can't relate, at least the geographical part. Are there gender-centric things on her list that are relatable to you? Definitely. And when you said woman in the late 60s in New York, I don't want any part of that. <laughs> that seems like a really fairly difficult existence. I'm thinking about that thing that we as women, I think much more than men face, which is that idea of, why don't you smile more? Mm -hmm. Or constantly having to explain ourselves in the workplace. I find myself right now, this is a new situation for me. I'm on a new team of people, four men and me. So I'm the only woman on this team. It doesn't feel odd at all, actually. I might have looked at it earlier as some sort of thing that I would have to assert myself. I'm not treated any differently, and I don't think I treat them any differently. It's a new and interesting thing. So while I am, in fact, the minority, I don't feel like one. One thing I guess I was not thinking about when I asked geographical, gender-centric I wasn't thinking about temporal, I guess. We've quote-unquote progressed in the last 45, 50 years or so. Not nearly as much as we could, obviously, but is that the biggest part of why you feel like you're not encountering that? I think so. I will, though, say in a work situation prior to this one, I was working with seniors, and I don't mean to cast wide generalizations, but I was at multiple points subject to having my cheeks pinched. <laughs> so some people have progressed, some people haven't. Did you at least get hard candy out of the deal? No. Well, somebody owes you a Werther's original. Well, so the fishmonger and the handsome cab drivers and all the accumulated street noise start to rise and rise until you realize someone is being assaulted and Patsy goes out into the street to confront who is making this noise and we find that it is a fight. This is after trying to call 911 to no avail multiple times. And she comes upon Elliot Gould as Alfred being beaten up by at least four people I counted. A gang of young toughs. Yes. And as she starts to try to beat them up, he manages to extricate himself and then they start to turn on her as Alfred walks away. So right away, I was loving this. Yes, he immediately endeared himself to me right here by not participating in the social contract as it is understood. He has his own system, and it infuriates her. You should have defended me. I defended you, is what she says very specifically. He didn't ask for your help, lady. He owes you nothing for your intervention. You took that upon yourself. And he makes a very good point when he mentions... There's no way of talking someone out of beating you up when they have their heart set on that. <laughs> the best part for me, aside from how funny this is, and I didn't necessarily know it was going to be so funny, is when he says, I want to do what I want to do, not what they want me to do. Interesting that you bring that up. What did you think going into it based on the title, based on who was in it, based on who created it? Did you have a specific impression of it beforehand? 
I did, and part of this was based on the title and then the DVD menu screen. Mm -hmm. I thought that Alfred was going to kill everybody. I thought that there was going to be some sort of a dinner party. I don't know where I got that in my head. And that he was just going to go on a murderous rampage that would also be probably hilarious. And it was interesting to me in doing some other research, looking at the movie poster and looking at the DVD cover itself and how all of those things are different. They each portray a different aspect. And even when you were talking about what the film is about, I felt like it was really pitched to Patsy's point of view. Mm. And for me, this was Alfred's film. I thought he was the main character. The Little Murders is about murders of the soul to me. And going back to something I mentioned earlier, the satire that speaks to me is less about the societal breakdown and the violence in the city and what everyone is feeling, this nervousness and anxiety. It's more about the romantic relationship, actually, and those little murders that I mentioned. I can't imagine, based on your history of choices for the program, that that's, Shocking. <laughs> that's the direction you would go with it. I do want to clarify here, though. I don't mean to state that Elliot Gould's performance overshadows everyone else. It doesn't, because this is truly an excellent cast. Mm -hmm. And Marsha Rod is wonderful Everybody in, this. in it is fantastic. There is no part in it that is not very well essayed. And so other people watching this may definitely think about Patsy the whole time. I, he just stood out for me. Well, we do love him. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We could do an entire podcast about Elliot Gould's career, and I would be happy. I don't know that there's anybody I'd rather watch when I think about it. And that is putting him up against huge favorites. That's him against Gazzara. That's him against Peter Falk. When it comes down to it, I don't think that there's anybody that I relate to more or that I think is more watchable in communicating these very specific ideas of this time and place that is my favorite. Yeah, I could talk about him all day long. It's also possible that I don't want to see myself as Patsy, so maybe <laughs> maybe there's some of that. Rest easy. You're not Patsy. Oh, thank you. Two things I want to mention before we move away from this scene. You mentioned all the posters and covers and promotional material. I think out of all of those, my favorite is the Statue of Liberty with the gun. Have you seen that one? I don't think so. That is my favorite out of all of that stuff. And two, the end of this scene where she accosts his attackers and he extricates himself and wanders off down the sidewalk. Spalding Gray based his whole career on that two minutes, it feels like. I feel like <laughs> Spalding Gray saw this and thought, there it is. There's the answer. This is what I'm doing for the next 20 years. Also a person who speaks directly to you. Directly to me. Speaking of Spalding Gray, I wanted to get into the nihilism angle a little bit right here too. Alfred identifies himself, at least at one point very briefly, as a nihilist. More prominently as an apathist, specifically, but he does mention the word at one point, and I'm not sure exactly how I feel about its application to this stuff. Maybe in the broadest historical and political sense, in that he finds nothing of value in the established social order, but he doesn't go as far, it seems, as saying that all values are baseless and nothing can truly be known. He does continue to embrace the part of it that's extremely skeptical, which I love, which is one thing I certainly relate to. But he also, like me, finds humor in the absurdity of everything. It is a pitch black comedy, we should mention. But it is definitely comedy. And I've never encountered a film that I can recall that so successfully does both at the same time. Usually one is in service of the other, or one gets compromised for the other. Say you have a total of 100 and you can get 70 comedy and 30 darkness, or vice versa, whatever your ratio is. In this case... You seem to be able to have 100% of both somehow. Going back to my assumptions before seeing this, I thought that in this dinner party scene I was dreaming up in which he would kill everybody, that's when the comedy would happen. I didn't know it was going to be funny throughout. That makes me think of a huge tangent, so bear with me for okay. a second. You mentioned nihilism. I'm thinking again about Roger Ebert, and the first thing it made me think Noted of... Noted nihilist. <laughs> Is, was he? I, I would say not. Okay. Well, here we go in my story. You can't be that populist and be nihilist. The first thing it made me think of was his review of Team America World Police. Okay. He loved this film, Little Murders. Right. Very excellent review for it. Team America 
almost made him angry, it seemed like. And he referenced specifically, this is nihilism. And in that context, it seemed to be a bad thing. That makes me think about the time element. At this time, 1971, the nihilism seemed to be in its favor, but he wasn't feeling it decades on. Okay, interesting. Time and context make a huge difference in this stuff. So you feel like perhaps based on where we were as a culture then, it was more palatable. Not in fashion necessarily, because it did take a couple of tries for this to get up on its feet and find its audience. And there's a tagline that was used in one poster, which was funny in a new and frightening way. So new and frightening to whom? And I think about Roger Ebert being the generation of the film when the film came out. If that captures how your generation is feeling, that's wonderful. If you are then in a later generation and don't take kindly to a younger generation suggesting that nihilism is the way to go. So was it before its time, of its time, both? I think before more than of. I mean, clearly it's a time capsule when you look at it. It can only have been created from those specific circumstances and conditions, but its history, like I mentioned, tells me very specifically before its time. Its initial production run on stage was seven days closed. It had to go overseas to the UK where audiences are much more perceptive about satire, I feel like, at least then, maybe still now, and then come back here in 1969 for a much more successful second run before it was then turned into this film which still hasn't found a huge audience. And I think the massive change in social conditions between 1967 and 1969 point to the fact that Jules Pfeiffer was on to something and the audience was not ready to go there yet. Only after being inundated with two years of assassinations, war, a litany of literal murders on their televisions, was the audience more aligned with what he was saying two years prior. He mentions, Jules Pfeiffer mentions very specifically when talking about this film, that it was an essay on the post-assassination climate of urban violence. And he very specifically says that the country was having an unacknowledged and unstated nervous breakdown. But has it ever been different? Have we ever not been in that condition in 200 plus years as a nation? I can't think of a time when there was not upheaval. That seems like a much larger discussion to have <laughs> that we would need to table for the moment. But I'm thinking about what movies tell us mm -hmm. about how we're feeling and how we dip in and out of those. And it's only from the movies, Desperately Seeking Susan, we mentioned, that I learned how terrible it would have been to live in New York in the 70s. And glorious. Simultaneously. For you. I assume I would have been a Son of Sam victim or something. <laughs> Or heroin overdose, or who knows. Well, the one thing he does mention in that discussion that I think is still valid and is obviously an ongoing spectrum of events, all forms of authority losing their validity. When you look at that never-ending cycle, that downward spiral since the end of World War II, I would probably say, I don't think that has done anything except steadily decline. The amount that people trust institutions, trust the government, I think that has been in perpetual steady decline ever since then. But before we stray too far afield, like you mentioned, let's get back to Patsy. I want to know what you think about her as a character. I think she is a monster. <laughs> Not an evil monster, but a monster nonetheless. And I am delighted that I have never been entrapped in her web because I think there's no way to get out of it without killing her. Spoiler alert. Not to tip my hand. <laughs> For Patsy, it's all about what I think of as that modern idea of consumption. Everything is there to be consumed. Most noticeably, Alfred. Everything exists to be consumed, which means that she is happy and successful and therefore living life to its fullest. There are all of those moments in their dating cycle when it feels like especially that she's the cruise director who will <laughs> never stop. It's all of these measurements and metrics and questions and obligations and demands and need for affirmation and validation, which is why I asked for you to confirm that I'm also not Patsy. That's the validation I'm looking for. 
And this is one of the reasons that I wish I had seen this earlier because she speaks in those book cover titles. Men who love women too much, women who love men too much. Mm -hmm. He doesn't love me, why not? All of this endless need to figure something out that we should really intrinsically know and understand. Well, Pfeiffer took a couple of shots at that sort of culture, both the intellectual high-minded version of that when we meet Alfred's parents and this sort of cosmopolitan, I'm okay, you're okay part of it. And this gaping maw of insecurity that constantly has to be fed and those petty lists of annoyances It is exhausting, and I want to stick a fork in her eye. And that moment later, when she is laying out the master plan of how to destroy his life, at least that's how I think of it, (laughs) sounds like hell on earth. Do you think her character is also a critique of, an indictment of, second wave feminism that was happening then? Focusing on more domestic-oriented issues than policy issues. Is she somehow supposed to be an avatar of that, a product of that? Because there's an argument we hear frequently now that we know what people mean when they say a woman is bossy. That it is somehow trying to undercut her authority to take that edge off to keep her in a subservient role, criticizing her for doing that. Does Patsy go beyond that somehow? It is satire, obviously. So is it a caricature like I mentioned? It is definitely satire. However, turn on Dr. Phil and these conversations are still being had. This characterization, as written by Jules Pfeiffer, does not feel mean-spirited or misogynistic to me. Okay. Do you agree? I think so. Okay. So it doesn't feel like an indictment so much as, let's really look at what this culture has created. And I think it applies to men and women. Certainly no one is spared in this thing. And Marsha Robb brings so much humanism to this as well. You know, I'm saying I want to stick a fork in her eye. She's, she's not an evil person. And she's not grating. I think you mean more you want to stick a fork in that idea's eye. Good point. It's just incessant. Well, she certainly specifically makes clear to him during this dating montage that you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Except have fun. Which is the story of my life, it feels like. Not with you specifically, but just versus the world at (laughs) large. Thanks for adding that in. And it's not an introvert versus extrovert thing either, because that's not me. I don't care about that stuff. Although for some people, I'm sure it reads that way. For me, it is a much longer, lifelong fight against, we do it this way because this is the way it's always been done. Sorry, not going to be a participant. The thing I'm always left wondering is, have you ever stopped to ask why it's always been done this way? If there's another way? Okay, now that you say that, I'm starting to have a massive anxiety attack that maybe I am in fact Patsy because I enjoy having fun and try to do most things in order to have fun. I do think of that as a mindset and I know you do not. And we talk about it. Yeah. So... So get out of my face. Oh, gosh. (laughs) No, generally, we have a very good time. You are not. Generally, we have a very good time. (laughs) You are not. On Thursday, from 7.15 to 7.30, we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. You are not Patsy. Did I mention that? I'm going to ask you 12 more times. Okay. This dating montage, by the way, happens 10 minutes in or so. We are off to the races in this movie. It goes so fast, it feels like. Because she makes her decision. Their decision. For her and him. Yes. I found myself wishing, though, throughout this, even though she is terrible, that I wish more romantic comedies were like this, solely based on the fact that it doesn't assume the audience are fools. It treats you as if you understand. If more romantic comedies were like that, I would watch a lot more of them. Speaking of the assertive second-wave feminist, this is also where he resists her sexual advances. She is in the position of power, obviously. She is the one dictating how this goes. And he stops it. He opts out of it as being a power situation and says, I don't feel like it. Which I thought was great. Again, if I had just watched this decades earlier, I think I would have learned and understood more about life, about what life could be. You mean a dystopian hellscape which ends in a murder spree? (laughs) 
Yeah, and no sex. <laughs> sounds, <laughs> sounds great. You know, really, mostly at the uh, basic level, if you don't feel like it, don't do it. I could have applied that in some situations. Everybody probably could at some point or another. Again, it's one of those things, like I mentioned with the Pope of Greenwich Village, where you learn something that you've never quite heard put that way before. Little Murders could be that sex ed for somebody. Yeah. And speaking of sex ed and tying things together like we always like to do, we mentioned in the Say Anything episode, just the episode previous, there was a lot of discussion about declarations of character and first times. In this case, I love that his most romantic proclamation is, I really nearly trust you. That's as far as he can go, and that's enough for her to take him to bed. And their first time happens in the middle of her ransacked apartment that has been destroyed while they were out for a weekend. And the first time they are together is literally in the middle of rubble, wreckage from this destroyed apartment. It feels like hell on earth. I referenced this earlier. (laughs) This is when she makes this big declaration herself of every single thing she's going to do to the apartment. This is an opportunity, an opportunity to redo all of this. She has this massive plan that results in him moving in and them getting married two weeks later. The look on his face to me is, you're, where's the gun? For the record, you're making the face right now. Am I? I, I was reliving it. <laughs> I think in the same way, and not to fall into uh, the everybody loves Raymond school of doing things, it's also the same look uh, when you were telling me when we first met about how you were never going to go into a Home Depot. <laughs> And then the first time we went into a Home Depot. (laughs) In my online dating profile, I very specifically mentioned appreciating a woman who likes to get her hands dirty. Which I meant as climbing out on rock outcroppings that you're not supposed to, jumping fences that are illegal. Adventures of all sorts where you took it to mean, I think, bags of mulch. Yes. (laughs) Uh, and I should have said I withdraw the question because you also said literally and figuratively, sir, <laughs> literally means there should be dirt on my hands. Where is dirt? It's in the backyard. So I thought you were saying I'm looking for someone who will zero escape with me. <laughs> I'm going on the record right now. I am never building a railroad tie fence. Thanks, Mrs. Rolaine, for ruining everything for us. Well, speaking of the family, and more Say Anything parallels for that matter, it's family audition time for Alfred. Alfred is coming to meet the Newquists. And at the door, he mentions more than once, and I'm quoting here, I really hate families. But is he right or wrong in this case? There's something kind of lovable about all of them, too. It's a madhouse. Yes, I certainly get that. But is it any worse than what is happening outside? I think just like Patsy, they are monsters. But not evil monsters. This scene is wonderful and long. And I think this is the theater aspect coming into play. And also showcases, I think, what a wonderful job Alan Arkin did Mm. as a director. Because everyone in this scene must do what theater actors do. Which is be in character and on the entire time. Even when the camera is not on them. Because... The camera is constantly moving, and everyone themselves are all moving as well. So the focus is constantly shifting, and it's not done from an editing standpoint. It's everyone working. This is my absolute favorite. This I mean, scene? Yes, I love everyone in this. To me, also, it's the flat-out funniest. This is one of those instances that Ebert and Arkin were talking about where different things are hitting different parts of the audience at different times. So... I would quibble with your assessment of it being the funniest, and it is my second favorite for a number of reasons. But the wedding scene, to me, is the funniest. That is not to say that there are not a ton of great things happening here. So much is going on. You've got all these barely sublimated (laughs) urges and feelings that are going on. You have the entire maternal history of the Newquist clan manifesting itself in Mrs. Newquist. Every interaction between Patsy and her father or Patsy and her brother has epically Freudian levels of play fighting and wrestling happening. John Corks is another in the oh, long so line great. of brothers are kooks, and he's the best. 
<laughs> Elizabeth Johnson is my favorite in this she and, film. She's my favorite person in the really? film. Yeah. She and Vincent Gardenia are reprising the roles they played on stage in that production for this. They've got it down. I think she has the best lines. Oh, without a doubt. In this scene, yes. And I love watching how everything is working as Alfred has no chair, clearly. So any time that we happen to see where he is, it's going to be backed into a corner or against a wall or awkwardly somewhere. Or Kenny is going to end up on his lap. <laughs> well, I specifically like it because we learn the most about Alfred right here, I think. His survival strategy, him being an apathist as his philosophy... How things don't hurt you if you daydream. He's developed all of these coping strategies to live in this world. And who are they to invalidate him? Again, this is me putting myself in his shoes and having these arguments for my entire life. Who are they to say that his way of doing things is the incorrect way of doing things? I don't know. Even though sometimes they seem stymied or even angered by things, they still really just want to know who he is. And that makes me think of earlier today, my mom was on the phone and said, is Cole still the same wonderful, <laughs> lovely, calm, laid back guy? <laughs> oh, sucker. Yeah, really. Did you tell her yes? Of course I did. Good job. He also outlines this episode with his work. He's a photographer in which he mentions he was losing his people, quote unquote. He was losing his ability to literally focus on and take proper pictures of human beings to the point that he could only accurately photograph inanimate objects now. And as it is well-observed satire, this has then evolved into just taking pictures of shit because he realized people will buy anything. This was the one thing that was a little on the nose for me. I think it fails as a joke because it's too pat, too easy. I think a smarter joke could have been told right there. I love his delivery when he makes that exclamation of people will take anything. Mm -hmm. Basically, I'm paraphrasing. Because this is that window into a person he used to be, how he used to react, into how he feels now. And those individual straws that then broke the camel's back. Mm. Well, while we are learning about him and his history with these things, we also see Patsy struggling with the notion that he is the only man who is not waiting for her to save him, therefore he becomes irresistible. She later says that he's her toughest reclamation project. How much of this behavior in the public at large is instinct, and how much of it do you think is fulfilling a role that is expected of them, that's prescribed? And do they show us her family to let us know why she is the way she is, do you think? Is that what it actually shows us? Working the self-help section in the bookstore makes me think the latter. I know I'm asking you a lot of questions here. I was going to respond exactly that way. I was going to say, you work in a bookstore, you see these titles are still being generated. Mm -hmm. So yes, these are roles. And everything we see happen in that scene, every way her mother speaks to her and every way her father speaks to her, indicate the person that she became. And then here are some photos of Patsy's dead brother, Steve. <laughs> This scene, more than any other scene in the film, I will say for it, has me fascinated with imagining the writing process. Personally, I think Jules Pfeiffer just turned on a tape recorder at some event that he was at. The pushiness of come here, come here, come here, answer all of our questions, tell us everything that we want to know, love us, come into our family, and then at the moment that we're done and our routine needs to take place again, news time or silent vacuum time, and oh, but don't go unless you feel you must. <laughs> there is always a sense of obligation that you have to fulfill unless you're Alfred. Well, Patsy decides for them that they are going to get married. And his only request mirrors my only request. No God in the ceremony. Sidebar here. Imagine my horror when I went to City Hall to get the copy of what the ceremony was going to be. And because it's Texas, God or Jesus, I think, was listed as every fourth word. Well, Lou Jacoby, the judge whom we are about to meet, would love that, at least the God part. It's a very Old Testament sort of speech that he's giving as to why these institutions cannot be undermined with your glib atheism. 
It's all about persecution and sacrifice. People sure do like recounting their struggles and persecution, don't they? They do. Job also probably couldn't afford to be really glib about God. My immediate reaction watching this, and it's framed very specifically, him speaking from the bench, American flag behind him, looming like a grotesque. My gut reaction, God has no business in court, in a court of law. This is what it feels like to me to listen to any zealot of any stripe evangelize about anything, basically. And his story gets more sad and more deprived and exaggerated as it goes on. It's awfully funny, but there is an awful lot of frustration for me watching this scene. And Patsy's father, Carol, isn't taking very kindly to this either. This subversiveness. They're sitting together having a drink, and he's asking him about his family. Carol asks Alfred, are your parents alive? Uh, I think so. What does that mean? Where are they? Uh, Chicago, I think. It's uncommon, I suppose, but for me, not so much. Again, something I relate to. I don't have a ton of regular contact with my family, except for my sister. I, I talk to my sister all the time. But at least relative to the amount you do, it seems like. And probably relative to the amount that most people do. Minimal contact for me with all human beings is the best way to go. And I think it's important to point out, it's not because there's any sort of a negative relationship. No. That has nothing to do with it. Right. Just don't need it. Don't need constantly. And I think my approach to it, and its correctness, <laughs> at least for me, is borne out by Patsy's father's reaction to all of this. He mentions bitterness, implying that that's at the root of Alfred's denial of the deity. And Alfred tells him, I'm not bitter, Patsy's not bitter. Patsy's father clarifies, it's he that is bitter. What Alfred is saying makes complete sense. He's thoughtful and calm. And Carol is in a rage with Alfred rejecting the status quo. You so often see this manifest itself in people's concern, often explicitly family members, about whether or not you're going to have children, is what it made me think of as I was watching this. Not my folks, thank goodness. I'm not bitter, you're not bitter, is what I would tell people, but guess what? What happens in our lives is none of your business. No one else lives in this house. No one else participates in this marriage. So therefore, we are going to decide how we want these things to go. And I guess I'm in the minority of people that finds that easy to say to other people. Does it give you anxiety to have to communicate that to someone? I don't know that your parents necessarily push you for that sort of thing. I don't think they do. I've never heard them say a single thing about it. Oh, no, absolutely not. It makes me think of that line in The Man Who Came to Dinner. I left home at four and they hear me on the radio and that's good enough for them. I'm exaggerating because I do talk to my parents multiple times a week mm -hmm. together and separately. And now as an adult, I share a lot of things with them. When I was younger, I did not. Mm -hmm. I didn't with anybody, really. Mm -hmm. I just kept things to myself and especially from them. And I think they know and, and understand who I am and know have never pushed me to go one way or another or to have some sort of an answer to a question that they had. Probably because they knew before you did that I don't respond well to authority figures. <laughs> well, we are some of the lucky few, I gather, because from what I understand, from what I've heard, it's a source of great anxiety to have to deal with these issues with family and other people trying to dictate to you what you should do. You want another child in the world? Great. Go ahead. Have one. That's what I say. Knock yourself out. Have ten for all I care. But you don't get to vote on mine. Same goes for your deities. How often do you think it is that people like Patsy's father are angry because we Alfreds are able to just say no things? And they want to, but they feel stuck in the roles that they occupy. Wouldn't they ultimately feel better to be able to stand up and say, you know what, I don't believe in these conventions either. I'm no longer going to participate. How much of that do you think drives their frustration and anger with characters like Alfred? I think it's a great point, and I would say that definitely seems to be the motivation. If you see the person doing the thing that you would really like to do and getting away with it, <laughs> but you feel that you can't somehow, that sense of obligation, how toxic the idea of obligation, and you know what, I hate the word toxin, and I just said toxic, and now I want to stab my own eye. But you get my point. Mm -hmm. Well, the one place where Alfred and I part ways here 
is that he specifically says he is not a debater. Definitely not me. Definitely not you. <laughs> but you're so calm and laid back. Right. Well, wedding day has arrived. My favorite scene. The funniest scene to me in the whole thing. And immediately I am laughing because the wedding bells are warped and distorted. It is such a nice touch. And we get the joy of having Donald Sutherland and Elliot Gould together again. So I think Donald Sutherland is the funniest part of the scene. I still think the family scene is the funniest. I wish we could have gotten this guy to do our ceremony. <laughs> we did have the judge on the iPad and it took two minutes. That was pretty perfect. But the judge on the iPad didn't say things that indicated he understood me, like an abandonment of ritual and search for truth. That's very true. But he surprised us. No God in the ceremony. So we did get that. He did not, however, like Sutherland does, go into a dissection of why does one choose to do this? Which I think is a great idea. Why does somebody want to get married? Why did you want to get married to me? Oh, um, <laughs> where, where do I start? Uh, it was a little bit of a shocking thing to me. Was it to you that we found ourselves in this position? A little bit. And at the same time, it seemed like the clearest decision, easiest decision, most straightforward and honest and logical decision that we were going to be together. Now then, why we chose to make it legally binding, so sinister, as he says, <laughs> that part I actually can't remember. Do you? It's Do you a little, what the decision making was? It seems a little contradictory to me when I sit and think about it, because as much as I talk about and desire to be an iconoclast, it is definitely trying society's way a little bit. I also assumed uh, by that point that I wouldn't get married. Hmm. And we could have just lived together. Um, I guess this now forms the basis of our second podcast. <laughs> okay. Why did we get married? Well, he says a lot of things in the ceremony that appeal to me. There are a lot of ideas that he explores here that are blasphemous in a traditional <laughs> wedding ceremony that I think are great questions to ask. And they're great questions to ask right then. Because it is indeed a small single step. Anyone who is somewhat pragmatic and takes the long view of things has to know that all possible outcomes are almost infinite. We hope that things are going to go a certain way, but our lives are our own precedent. When you think back 10 years, could you have imagined you would be here right now? Anyone in the sound of my voice, when you think back 10 years, would you have imagined you are sitting where you are doing what you are doing right now with your life? Not a rhetorical question. Oh, you're asking me yeah. now? Okay. No. <laughs> you want to elaborate on that a little bit? I assumed I would be sitting in my golden palace. Okay. Russell Crowe would be my husband, and look how close I got to that. That's why I married you. Joking aside, no. I assumed I would still be on my own, mm -hmm. doing my own thing, whatever that is. I'm the sort of person who is always looking for something new to try and learn and do. And so I've changed jobs and careers many times. And so I long ago stopped looking ahead one year, five year, 10 years, mm -hmm. open to all sorts of things. And to quote the esteemed reverend, that's all right. Embrace what an absurd idea it is that you think you know what is coming. I might argue that it's even more romantic to enter into a union knowing that deep in your heart. And to then go ahead with marriage anyway. Patsy's Alfred's answer, and vice versa, today's answer, and that's enough. It's ridiculous to behave as if you're promised anything else. I feel the need to circle back to that question and answer definitively why we got married. Okay. Do you have a definitive answer? My argument, I think, as I'm putting forth right here is that even if I put forth an answer right now, it's a ridiculous thing to try to do. Because you cannot define that thing, and it's going to evolve and change, and so any answer we give is just strictly today's answer. Trying to think back to those earlier days, and it just seemed like a good and, dare I say it, fun thing to do. Still treated with reverence and a commitment that we decided to make to each other. But importantly, not done as a sense of obligation or as a role to fulfill or complete. 
done on our own terms. Well, if this is going to be done on anyone's terms, it's going to be done on Patsy's terms. And specifically, she says to Alfred, I love the man I wanted to mold you into. I don't want to hurt you. I want to change you. She's a failure if he doesn't change. She cannot live happily if she does not make him become something that he currently is not. And they hash all this out, and ultimately, she is somewhat cowed by this. And he is more disturbed by her acquiescence than her fighting. Her constant badgering is considerably less disturbing to him. He is much more unsettled when her pendulum swings over to his apathetic side of things than her optimistic side of things. That is what stirs him to action. Because for me, it's because he doesn't want to change her. And when he sees that that could be a possibility, I don't think he wants that to happen. How come? Is this noble, this thing that he's doing? I think it's just true to his character. He doesn't have a sense of obligation as to what she should be. So how she has presented herself to him has been consistent and honest and above board this entire time, even though the motivations are cringeworthy, for her to suddenly become a different person, he doesn't want any part of that. Well, as a result, he takes a trip to Chicago to dig into his upbringing, taking a questionnaire for his parents that she has developed. I really like the reversal that we find here as well. He is fleeing the cosmopolitan coast, where things are in such decay that everyone is reverting to a conservative self-preservation to go into the heartland where we discover his parents are essentially limousine liberals. He poses these questions to them. They end up eventually pleading the fifth, essentially. It's the part right before that that I'm really interested in. Okay. He's got this series of questions involving happiness, anxiety, breastfeeding, toilet training, tantrums. And instead of choosing to answer those as one human to another... Specifically about their relationship, specifically about the instances that they engaged in these things together, not as larger ideas. And all they can do is cite references about how one might feel about those things or observe those things. It's that third party interaction. I think again about say anything, you making those points about how communication happened through third parties. It's very much this other world commenting on human everyday life that they seem to have no access to. Even drier than it being passed from one hand to another, it is specifically just reading footnotes to him, essentially. Yes. And I believe this scene was actually added for the film, mm -hmm. correct? What purpose do you think it serves? I think specifically it underlines the fact that his detachment comes as no surprise. Absolutely. I think it's also, though, as opposed to being... An unnecessary addition? I love the scene. I specifically love it to see Doris Roberts playing against what we now think of as her type. Same for me to a certain extent with John Randolph. True. So not the most fruitful trip? I disagree with you because I think it really makes sense with what comes afterward. Hmm, okay. Describe this scene for us. Well, what comes afterward upon his return... Alfred is recounting for Patsy a story of paranoia about when he used to be much more of an activist than an apathist. His mail was being monitored, and so he began to write letters specifically to the person doing that job and then send them to himself. It escalates until a strange confrontation with this person occurs, and I was struck that throughout this exchange, the thing that Alfred was most interested in to me, it seemed like, was humanity both the male reader's humanity and his own. He initially implored him to sit down and talk it out, was his initial reaction to this intrusion. He wasn't reserved, he wasn't detached. I would say, from the way he described it, he nearly craved this interaction with this person. It seemed almost desperate to forge a connection. So clearly he wasn't always devoid of feeling. He's been capable in the past, so what's the difference now? I'm thinking about a couple of things that he says. Ultimately, after he's telling this story, it's about why fight back. And as he gets more of a bowed head, it becomes, I don't stand a chance. Very soon I'll be different. What that suggests to me is this trip to Chicago maybe unlocked some of those memories that he was closer to at the time of this male story. The male story was closer to when he had left home, mm -hmm. 
assuming his parents were always that way, that was a reaction to that sort of life. And then he got further and further removed from that to the point where he couldn't recall any of these answers to those questions himself. And when he finally says, I'm the one who has to change, you're not the one who has to change, which I think you and I would both react to that very differently. And he says it a couple of times. I think it's that decision that I'm not going to follow that idea of alienation down its logical path to where my parents are. So I think it's the ultimate bridging scene. I think it's that last peg in a series of this is what I don't want and being kind of broken down. Well, he certainly seems to be struggling to retain his identity as he knows it, which again, I understand can be difficult for some people, especially in the context of a relationship, a new relationship especially. Has that been hard for you? Do you find yourself doing things differently because of your relation to me? In terms of what you feel your true self is, have you felt yourself move somehow? It's not hard for me, and I have felt myself move. Hmm. And I do do things differently. Again, sorry, these are really complex questions mm. that it would take me a very long time to answer. The briefest way I can put that is, finally, being with a person to whom I could express everything I feel and expose every single part of who I am, which I never did before. Maybe people who were more open cannot relate to this, but I was never in a position where I felt like the other person or persons could understand, support, or react to properly to what I was going to tell them. And you're the person who was different. And so I don't have to fall into some role. I'm just myself. So what you went through is the opposite of what you see happening to him. So can you relate to what he's going through in this case? Because for me, it's sometimes tough to balance certain things, especially when it comes to what I might be giving up versus what I might be getting in return. Compromise is rarely, well, never easy for me. It is the most difficult thing I have to do in the context of being together. And in this case, I really relate specifically to his dilemma because he so specifically dreads becoming optimistic. He is so not looking forward to looking at a glass of water and thinking about that as being half full. It's odd. Here's another layer of, of what I see as an oddity. You are not an only child. I am. Mm -hmm. One might expect you to be more used to compromise. You have a larger family, more voices, more people. I don't. I always did my own thing my own way. And yet, I think I have an easier time with making some compromises. I don't even think of them as compromises. Mm -hmm. I accepted that and hopefully embraced, even though it's difficult sometimes, that this is a new unit. Right. We're a new thing. We have to do things differently. It can't always just be my way. Nor should it. Nor do I always have the best way. Well, he's certainly facing that problem, for sure. So I can't really relate because I don't think he should be the one to change. And I want to point out to anyone out there who is an eternal optimist who might not get how tough this is to go from half empty, or not even half empty, but say you're not a pessimist, say you're just a pragmatist, to go from that to a half full outlook is a seismic shift in philosophy. That is no small thing. It is upending your entire worldview to have to try to take on this new way of thinking. It's not easy. It's immense when I stop and think about it. I mean, honestly, just for the two of us, I'm practically Pollyanna in comparison. <laughs> Whereas in every other situation in my life, I'm called intense mm -hmm. and... Uh, incredibly self-aware as being a negative thing and... Bossy. Bossy, <laughs> absolutely. Well, she says one thing here that loses me forever for her. I would have gotten up and walked out the door when she lays this, there are reasons for doing things the old way on him. Sorry, bye, we're done. There's nothing more for us to discuss. Bullshit. Get out of your lane once in a while. If you want him to upend his entire worldview, you have to move a little bit also. Now, knowing that, why is his first feeling that he describes worship? 
has he truly been waiting for someone to come along and take control this way, do you think? I wrote this a couple of times. I think she's just broken his spirit. Hmm. I think she's just talked him into giving it up and wearing him down so that she will stop saying it. Well, it's the wrong decision to make in my estimation, and that is confirmed because payment happens in blood right here. Patsy is killed. You set this up earlier, and it happens that quickly. She says, you're going to be just fine. They're embracing, and the gunshot comes through the window. It's a sniper from outside whom we don't see. And she is dead. They're both on the floor. He's partially underneath her. He has to move her lifeless body off of him. It's an extremely shocking moment. And also one that I might point out. Yet another pivotal moment where you were looking out the window or dropped your napkin or that you missed completely. It's laughably, terrifyingly, relentlessly consistent that I am going to miss those moments. I spoiler alert for myself, had looked up the plot on Wikipedia because I had this idea of what was going to happen and then read this. About five seconds later, I was still looking at that screen and that's when it happened. Significantly here, his first non-beige item of clothing, his nice white shirt, is now soaked with her blood. And it's blood that never goes away for the rest of the film because we later see him wearing a highly uncharacteristic bright red sweater, as if the blood has continued to soak in and to spread, covering more of him all the time. Well, he's covered in blood, makes his way to her parents' house via the subway, where people don't particularly register this as an oddity or worth pointing out. And it's unremarkable. Yeah. Maybe the second thing that doesn't work quite well for me yeah a little lazy in terms of oh look how much things have spiraled out of control that this doesn't register for anyone and he even passes someone coming up the stairs who is has some sort of an injury to a massive head wound (laughs) and no one stopping for that person either so he makes his way to patsy's parents house and takes refuge there becoming one of the family at this point he's really catatonic to begin with And as he is recovering from this shock and being nursed back to health, he listens to Carol's litany of indignities and obstacles that he has to face that definitely echoes Patsy's. Patsy is definitely her father's daughter. And her murder seems to have been a catalyst for the outside world to go completely crazy. Everything goes from zero to 60 right here in terms of the complete breakdown of society. Another huge favorite of ours, Alan Arkin finally shows up. He is Lieutenant Practice who is investigating 345 unsolved homicides. He's a cop on the edge, but not like a Stallone character. <laughs> no, not He's at all. on the edge of a nervous breakdown. He is going mad because of a lack of any discernible pattern to this. Without reason, without logic, he does not want to go on. He would rather die. And when he outlines the problem of all of this, it's a real catch-22. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh. Good job. He suspects that the motive is to undermine his institution, among others. Which frames the ending to me in a really interesting way. Alfred brings home a rifle, and the film ends with the three men of the family taking pot shots at passersby down on the sidewalk. So if Lieutenant Practice is right, and now dead as it turns out, because Carol of their, shoots him. he's one of their victims, who's moved in their position ultimately? Practice says that it is the murderers and criminals who are trying to undermine institutions which seems to align with what Alfred has been doing, or at least been accused of doing all this time. Carol is taking part, and this subversiveness is what he's been struggling so mightily against all this time. Kenny joins in, and it's like he's fulfilling that role of the son that Carol hasn't had so far. And in Alfred's case now, nothing is more opposite of his previous non-committal stance than outright murder. That's as committed to an idea as you get. Is he embracing the new status quo, or has the world moved to where he was, and now he's just more comfortable in surroundings that have changed? I don't know, because he makes that choice, as an actor, to do the King Kong, gorilla, Mm -hmm. pounding, you know, male posturing, Mm -hmm. which doesn't seem like the world he inhabited before. So I think he's 
gone over to the other side. So he's reverted to this more conservative self-preservation. I think so. And mom is so pleased by the turn of events. (laughs) That is true. It's back to normal. It's so nice to have the family together again. We mentioned in the beginning that this movie is kind of a time capsule, but how much do things really change? Because, speaking of this conservative worldview, you have all of these things that are barraging the family unit. Atheism, homosexuality. But then you look at today's situation and you have things like the bathroom bill that is before the Texas legislature. You've got Watergate then, a couple years after this film was made, but you have the current political climate now. How much is different? Certainly audiences are more jaded and media savvy now than they were then. That I do not dispute. But is anyone any less firmly entrenched when it comes to ideology than they were then? Is it any different at all? Absolutely not. And I think this goes back to your point of, and so it has always been, and so it shall ever be. Maybe that's my small nihilism speaking, though. (laughs) So we've arrived at the end of the film then, and I know that you really wanted to make a point and make sure people understood how funny this is. Mm -hmm. Certainly. How important it is to you. Do you feel like you've done that? I think so. It's definitely why I chose it. The small nihilism thing that you just mentioned leads me to a set of final points, actually. I picked it because it espouses a lot of ideas I believe in and that are very central to my way of living that maybe I was unable to even articulate before they were crystallized in this thing for me. All I want most of the time is to be left alone and I have little patience for established social conventions that don't actually serve a purpose. Wouldn't say nihilist. I'm no apathist though. I don't know what I would call it exactly. An angriest? (laughs) An absurdist? Sounds right. An adversarist? Not a contrarian. No, definitely not. The tattoo on my left forearm reads, Let the battle be constant. Who are you telling? And I live by that, which you know, for better or worse. And battle is a very carefully chosen word for me in that context. Because that's definitely what it feels like. It's a difficult world to navigate sometimes as an atheist, as straight edge, as all of the other things that I am. Especially when I'm sometimes intentionally trying to be provocative. I bring that on myself a lot of the time. And I'm not saying I'm oppressed in any way. Don't read that that way. But I certainly rub up against things that are trying to push me certain directions that I don't want to go and that I don't believe in all the time. And so I've certainly had to develop a strategy to make my way in this world. And a long time ago, I decided that I make my stand every day simply by my example so I don't have to go and buy a rifle. (laughs) Not that that was what I was heading towards, but using this as my compare and contrast, I won't end up in that situation because I am not repressing these things and not being true to myself or making these extreme compromises. In addition to it, like you said, being really, really funny, it's really sharp and well-observed. And not from a pulpit. It's not preachy. No. No. Now, this is on my desert island list, like I said. Oh, really? Okay. You hadn't seen it before, and you were lamenting the fact that you had only found out about it just now. Yes. Had you known about this or left to your own devices, would you have chosen it for the show? If I had seen this when I was in my late teens, 20s, 30s, absolutely. Just discovering it today, maybe not. Hmm, How come? I think it's one of those that, as you mentioned, can crystallize a lot of thoughts and ideas and themes and questions that you didn't know that you had. Now that I've been through it and have found some other things that might have sort of taken its place, it doesn't feel as much like my desert island. And because I do respond so significantly to the relationship aspect Mm. of it, now it just feels like, oh, I'm so glad that I found this now and I can watch it later on. But it doesn't feel, I think, quite as striking to my very core as I think it does you. Okay. Well, how about instead you tell me about your life-changing recommendation that you're about to make? It absolutely did. I got to this because of Elizabeth Johnson when I was trying to decide what I wanted to recommend. So, drumroll please, my recommendation is... Nine to five from 1980, (laughs) which blew my mind when I was a kid. Oh, she's so great in it. Yeah. 
If You Didn't Know, directed by Colin Higgins with Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, and Dolly Parton. Three national treasures. Mm -hmm. The story of three female employees of a sexist, egotistical, hypocritical bigot of a boss who find a way to turn the tables on him. I vividly remember seeing this in the movie theater. Oh, me too. And then watching it many times on TV afterwards. This is one of those instances. I think I actually did speak a little bit about this in Desperately Seeking Susan as well. Realizing that, oh, I didn't know those kinds of people existed in the world. I didn't know when I eventually go into the workplace that somehow I'm going to be treated differently because I'm a woman. I wasn't aware of those things because I was so young Mm -hmm. when this came out. It was kind of frightening in a way. He's a frightening guy. He's a monster. He's an evil monster. Mm -hmm. Played by the great Dabney Coleman. It's also incredibly funny. And I love to see them get the upper hand. How could you not? So it's a little bit of a byway to get to there through Elizabeth Johnson. But she's so wonderful. She's Roz in this. That I wanted to really point her out. Which could have also been The Graduate, which is another one of those time and place and generation speaking Mm -hmm. for a generation. Are you about to sneak five recommendations in here? No. Okay. But do you want me to say the (laughs) other two that I was thinking about? (laughs) Sure, why not? I was also thinking about The Silent Partner because we just watched that. And also the other Jules Pfeiffer that I've seen, Carnal Knowledge. Mm, All great choices. But I got to nine to five and I'm sticking with it. Okay. How about you? For mine, I'm sticking with Elliot Gould as well, because I think we should celebrate his entire catalog all the time. Speaking of national treasures. I'll just buzz market on our own podcast and say go back to our long goodbye episode. And for my recommendation, I am choosing Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice from 1969. Directed by Paul Mazursky, starring Natalie Wood, Robert Culp, Diane Cannon, and the aforementioned Elliot Gould. It's about a couple that go on a retreat to find themselves and determine that complete openness and honesty is the only method by which to operate, and their fervor for this idea spreads to their friends, though they're initially reluctant, to say the least. This much candor, especially as it begins to incorporate sex into the conversation, is a difficult thing for people to deal with sometimes. The main connection here for me, though, is Elliot Gould, obviously who can do no wrong in my book. But it's a well-made, though not quite as vicious as this, satire, and was at the vanguard of major American films at the time that were calling into question a lot of things that people just assumed to be true. The counterculture was beginning to rear its head in a lot more mainstream films at this point, and movies were improved immeasurably for that reason, in my estimation. A lot of issues here that are linchpin issues for me unflinching honesty, bucking the system, sexual freedom, become topics of open conversation for a lot of people for the first time, maybe, because of this movie. We can argue about whether it went far enough or not, but I applaud and recommend it for at least opening the door, and it doesn't hurt that it's very smart and very funny. So that's 9 to 5 and Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. And that brings us to the end of episode 51. One thing I wanted to mention before we start doing our wrap-up here with our final housekeeping, in case you haven't seen it, you can go to our Facebook group, our Instagram, or our Twitter page and see our Fancy Pants new Magic Lantern pins that we have. We have one-inch enamel pins with a pretty rad glow-in-the-dark beam on them that we are now selling if you would like to pick up one of those. You can take a look at them there and contact us through any of those places. If you would like to reach us via traditional email, that's just magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. Like I mentioned, we are on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast there. We are on Twitter, at lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has given us feedback or shared the show or bought pins since our last episode. Drew Tavendale, Craig Eastman, and Scott Morris over at the podcast Fuds on Film. Travis Trudell. Eric Parkinson at the podcast This Must Be The Place, Adam Dotter, Andy Wolverton, Aaron West, Mike Scharf, Istara, Micah Matson, Eric Reese, Vanessa Van Alstein, Tim Lego, Jane Sankner, Chad Engelbert, Jason Beamish, Rebecca Laszlo, Carly Weems, 
RJ Tugas over at Make Mine Criterion, who did a great write-up on this movie. I'm going to link to that in the show notes so everybody can go take a look at that. And finally, Tim and Leon at the podcast Yaga Day, our first international sale. We are on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Radio. You can find us there or just about any podcatcher you use. If you'd like to leave us a review or a rating, we'd certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>